Hi guys, uh, welcome to the fourth lecture of Calictic Dynamics lecture series. Uh, I hope you, you are doing fine. Uh, so let's begin with a quick revision. So in the last lecture, we studied about modified Hubble profile, right? Whose spherical luminosity was given by this, spherical luminosity density was given by this. And then we evaluated the two dimensional surface brightness using the three-dimensional spherical luminosity density, right? So this is something very general, right? If you're given a three-dimensional luminosity for anything, you just need to take this projection along one of the axes of that system to find the two-dimensional surface brightness, for example. Then we went on to calculate the gravitational potential of such a gravitational system using Poisson equation again. Um, so I, I hope you are convinced now that you are convinced that how important Poisson equation really is because it wonderfully connects the density distribution of a system with the gravitational potential, right? And I would really request you guys and I hope that you guys are solving all these numericals or, or, or the steps that I miss because it's very important that you do these numericals by your hands and you do it, you write it, you take notes in your no notebook because that's the least we can do because we do not have telescopes to observe stars nor we have any computational exercise in which we can just put in our equation and then see the orbits evolve, for example, or see a cluster forming, for example, right? So it's very important. It's the least we can do to get our hands uh, on the theory of the subject that we solve these numericals, right? Uh, and then I hope you guys tried to calculate the, the, the circular velocity for such a system, right? Uh, it was a straightforward exercise. Then we moved on to a very interesting topic, which was potential density uh, for flattened systems, right? And we saw two systems in particular. One was plumber kuzmin model. So here's the gravitational potential for the plumber kuzmin model in cylindrical coordinates, right? And then we saw the surface density of such a disk-like system. And then we studied the logarithm potential and we saw that how it gives us flat velocity curves that we actually observe in galaxies, right? Uh, yes. So in, in this lecture, uh, uh, it would be a very short one and I would like to spend time on just one topic, but very important, which is potential energy tensor of a system. Okay. Right. Uh, so let's begin. Cool. So, yes, but first of all, uh, let me give you two exercises. So the first question that I that is proposed that you do it is that show that potential generated by a spherical density given by this formula over here, which is, uh, I'm sorry, which is uh, M, which is total mass of the system over four pi R J cube, where J is in the subscript and R J is a parameter of this system, times R J to the power four over R square, R plus R J to the power square, right? So if this is the density distribution given to you, find the corresponding gravitational potential of the system. The hint is pr pretty straightforward and I hope you already know it that you should do it using Poisson equation. And then after that, show that, that the velocity, circular velocity is constant for radius much, much smaller than RJ parameter and that the circular velocity approximately goes as one over under root radius given that this is this uh, happens for radius much much greater than rj so after solving for circular velocity you just need to use this approximation to observe that this is how circular velocity go the second question is that so the second question might not make any sense right now of course because we haven't covered the potential energy uh, tensor of the systems but you should give it a go you should give this numerical a try after i'm done with this lecture right 
So the question is to prove that Chandrasekhar put Chandrasekhar potential energy tensor for any spherical system has the form uh, W J K equals one over three W delta J K. So delta J K over here it's a Kronecker delta, and what Kronecker delta do, which I hope you guys already know, is that when J equals K, then Kronecker delta is one. And for any other combination of J and K over here, it's it's zero. So basically, so W J K, it's so W, it's a three cross three matrix, right? And W J K basically gives you all the uh, nine components uh, or nine elements of this three cross three matrix, right? So the aim is to show that only the diagonal elements survive for a spherical system. For the W matrix, right? And W over here, it's the total potential energy of the system. Okay. Right. So, so let's begin with the lecture now. Yes, so potential energy tensor for any system, it's very important to study, right? Because it, it, it simply gives you the work done in accumulating the system, right? So potential energy tensor, it's it's very important in classical mechanics or any field of physics. In fact, it's important in uh, solid state physics or gravitational physics or quantum field theory per se. Okay, so work done. Uh, so we already know that e the form of equation one, right? So work done accumulating the system together is given by W equal half integral over volume of density times gravitational potential, right? So W over here, it's the pot it's potential energy, right? So this we already know that if you want to accumulate mass and turn it into a system, right? So this is how much work is done, right? So, uh, but Chandrasekhar, a potential energy tensor. Uh, so this is something new that we will, so W over here in equation one, it's a scalar, right? And Chandrasekhar potential energy tensor by definition is given by equation two over here, right? So WJK over here, it's a three cross three matrix, right? It's three cross three because our space, the world we live in is 3D, right? It's three dimension. So J and K denotes the coordinates, the coordinate numbers, right? So I, for example, J, oh, I'm sorry. So this thing over here, it's J goes from one to three and K goes from one to three because we are dealing with J and K labels here right so it's a three cross three matrix and each element uh, w11 w12 w21 or w21 w22 like that is given by minus integral over volume density times the jth coordinate axis uh, the uh, uh, the length of that coordinate times the gradient of gravitational potential with respect to the kth coordinate, right? So the volume integral of this quantity uh, in equation two is what is defined to be Chandrasekhar potential energy tensor, right? Now let's try and uh, simplify this uh, equation a little uh, or rather have an insight of it. So we already know that the gra uh, from our undergrad classes that the gravitational potential for any system for a given density distribution at point x right is given by minus g integral over all volume rho x over x minus x prime which is basically the distance right between uh, the body the test particle and the system right uh, times t cube x which is to take the integral okay so this is something we already know, right? So uh, in the next step, you just need to sub substitute. I sub simply substitute three in two. So this three equation goes over here for phi, right? And equation two becomes WJK equals G integral of density times XJ times the, the, the derivative of this phi, which is this bracketed term right now, okay? times d cube x. So we are taking volume integral, overall volume. Now x dash and x are independent variables, right? So x dash does not depend on x. So when this thing happens, 
uh, we can exchange the in, the integrals for example or we can exchange the derivatives the derivatives can go in and the other derivative the first derivative can be taken before over the quantity before the second derivative and we can do stuff like that right so it's uh, so this is what we are, we are going to do right now so wjk equals g uh, integral so this so this integral in the bracket so now we have two volume integrals right one comes from the definition of phi and another one was already there right so it's wjk equals g double volume integral for rho x rho x dash xj so yes so now this derivative del over del xk in equation 4 when it's acted over here so since it's x so since this is rho x prime so rho x prime would just simply come out of this derivative because x and x prime are independent right so this del over del xk would only act on this one over distance term right it will only act on that and when it does this it produces so x over here it's a vector which has i j and k all three components all three coordinates right but when del over del x k acts on this vector only the coordinate axis which is same as this x k axis right only that term would survive right so for example for example if this del over del x k is actually the y axis of the cartesian coordinates then in this x vector over here out of x y and z components only y component would survive right so this is del over del y and when it's acted on this this vector over here only the yth component would survive right so similarly when it would act on this modulus term it would give you give you a cube in the denominator and only the since it's del over del x k then only the kth terms would survive right in this modulus and that's how we get this this term in the fifth equation right times d cube x prime d cube x so there there are two volumes so first we need to solve the d cube x prime volume and after that we solve the d cube x so these integrals are over entire volume okay yeah, yeah this is a little clumsy over here but i hope you get the point that uh, how we are solving for derivatives and how it, it's making sense right uh now x and x prime here are dummy variables so we can relabel it so this is a, st a standard procedure that is followed so for example the way we went from 4 to 5 and the way we are going from 5 to 6 it's a standard procedure that is followed whenever you study matrices right so in physics again be it solid state physics be it quantum field theory or be it quantum mechanics for example, this relabeling of elements uh, or the independency of uh, different variables, it's often introduced just to see uh, what kind of symmetry we can build uh, out of, uh, in, what kind of symmetry we can see in the system and then, you know, make uh, things simpler for ourselves. Yes, so the procedure to move from equation 5 to 6 is that x and x dash are dummy variables, so we can just relabel them. So what I've done is that here, so xj becomes xj prime, right? And xk prime becomes xk, and xk becomes sk prime. And in the modulus, it's the same, it remains the same, times d cube x prime, d cube x integral, right? Now what we would do is, since equation 5 and equation 6 are basically same because it still is wjk right we are, we are solving for wjk so what now we will do is that we will add these two equations equation 5 and equation 6 right that's what we will do and when it becomes 2 and when it becomes 2 uh, on the left hand side it, it becomes 2 wjk equals some quantity that 2 comes on that 2 comes down on the right hand side right and this is the equation that one would obtain right so this is a missing step that you might want to do it's it's pretty simple it's just two steps i think at max i'm missing so yes so this lengthy clumsy equation that we have is the final form that we've been wanting to obtain right now by the construction of this equation you can see that wjk it's a symmetric 
symmetrical matrix, right? So in this equation, if you'll try to interchange J and K, for example, so we have J here. So if I write, as, write it as XK prime minus XK times XJ prime minus XJ, you would see, or in fact, you can already see that it's the same thing that we would obtain, right? So that is what, so by the definition of symmetrical matrix, that WJK should be equal to WKJ, the W by construction, it's a symmetrical matrix, right? So, so that's one kind of symmetry that we found. And in fact, in many physical matrices, right? Uh, and everywhere in physics, uh, I mean, over 90% of uh, physical matrices that we deal with in physics are symmetric, actually. Now, let's try and calculate the trace of W right, and see what we obtain. So trace of any matrix is, it's basically sum over all the diagonal elements, right? So that is what trace of, trace of matrix is by definition. So now we are summing WII because we just need the diagonal elements, uh, W11 plus W22 plus W33, right? Summing from I equal to one goes through to three. So now we'll just sum it over, right? So. Uh, if you sum this equation over here for all the three components of I, right? So uh, you would end up with the trace W over here, right? So the way it's done is that you re you just rewrite minus half G, rho X, rho X prime, right? And then you have this since, yes, so I'm comparing it with the equation above. So when it's I, I, then these two bracketed terms are basically same, right? So they just become square. So that's why it's square over here. The denominator remains the same and integral over d cube x prime d cube x. Now, when you take this sum over i coordinates, right? So when you're taking sum over this, over this term for all three coordinates, what you're basically doing is you're doing x, for example, for a Cartesian, uh, coordinate system consisting of x, y, z coordinates, right? So the sum is basically over this term is basically equivalent to x square plus y square plus z square, right? So that's the, so that's like distance square, right? So when you take the sum over this all term, uh, so when you take this sum over this bracketed term, what you end up with is distance square which is exactly similar to what you have in the bottom, except that you have square above and you have cube in the denominator. So the square would cut, uh, I mean, they would cancel each other in the bottom, right? And you would end up with just uh, a single power term in the denominator, right? So everything remains as it is, except that the, the numerator, uh, the square of the numerator cancels with the square of the denominator and one ends up with just single part term in the denominator, right? Now we know from definition and from previous slide in equation three that we had that this term over here, it's gravitational potential of that system, right? So we just substitute phi x simply over here and we end up with this expression that is very similar that we have it in the beginning and we know it from our undergrad classes, right? So this is the total potential energy of the system. And mind you that we obtain it not by calculating the determinant of the system, but the trace of the system, okay? Uh, yes, so I hope you're following. Uh, yes, so this, is, this would be my last slide for today. And in this, uh, let's try and do some application. Uh, of the Chandrasekhar potential energy tensor so that we can get the feel of exactly what we're trying to do, right? So consider a homogeneous sphere of radius A and density rho naught, right? So suppose you have a sphere of radius A and everywhere on the sphere, the density is constant given by rho naught, right? So we know the W, the total potential energy of the system would be given by half integral over volume of density times gravitation potential rate, which which basically by the definition of uh, Chandrasekhar is minus rho x, x vector dot del phi by del x, right? 
So previously it was xj del phi by del x k, right? But that was w j k element. Right now we are trying to solve. Uh, we are trying to uh, solve for the total potential of the system. So it's just the dot product that we get, right? So it's again like calculating the trace of the matrix, right? So it's i i plus j j plus k k element, right? So it's dot product. Now for spherical systems. Del phi over del x k, so this is the gradient, right? So, uh, so this term over here, it's the gradient of the system. So del phi over del x del x vector, it's the gradient of the system. But since we have a spherical, uh, we we are dealing with a sphere, it's better to uh, go from uh, Cartesian coordinate system to spherical coordinate system to make things simpler, right? So this gradient in uh, a uh, spherical coordinate system would have three terms, which would be R cap term plus the phi, the azimuthal angle term, plus the theta cap, which is the, uh, the, the, the second angle in the spherical system that goes from zero to pi, right? Uh, it's called the polar angle, I guess. I'm not sure. Don't take my word for it. Yes, but I'm writing just the R cap term out of these three terms is because since phi depends only on r since it's uh, an isotropic homogeneous sphere it's uh, it's a symmetrical spherically symmetric system so only del phi by del r term would survive the del phi over del theta term would be zero and the del phi uh, over del azimuthal angle term would be zero as well and only the r term would survive that's why i'm writing just the r term R cap over here, it's of course the uh, the uh, the normal vector, right? Uh, uh, in the radial direction. Yes. Uh, now del phi by del r is given by g m r over r square e r cap, which is again the the uh, the unit vector pointing in the. So I I've just written r cap as E R cap over here, just so that not to confuse it with the, with the radius magnitude and E R cap, it's the, uh, uh, the, the unit vector in the radial direction, right? So yes, so del phi by del R is given by this term over here, right? So M R basically means, uh, because it's always important to remember what every uh, function means in an equation, right? So M R over here means the entire mass contained up till radius r, right? So the entire mass within radius r is what is expressed as mr, right? Yes, so since now we have del phi by del x term over here, now let's try and calculate the, poten the total potential energy of the system. So w is equals minus, so now we are doing volume integral in the spherical coordinates, right? So the radius, in general would go from zero to infinity rho r r e r cap right times so just rewriting this equation again in the uh, spherical coordinate system times del phi by del r so which is gmr over r square e r so we've just calculated it r square dr this term comes because we are uh, trying to calculate volume right so so this this term r square dr d phi sine theta d theta it's basically the uh, tiny elemental volume in the spherical coordinate system, right? But now, I, right now, I have already splitted them uh, in the R uh, segment and the phi segment and the theta segment to show you that they are independent variables right now. And we can uh, do the integration over these variables R phi and theta independently, right? So we know that this term in total would give us four pi, right? So the d phi integral, we would get two pi and with sine theta d theta integral from zero to pi, we would get two, which would give us four pi. The interesting part to do is, is solve this integral over here, which is again, might look a little clumsy, but it's straightforward and you should give it a try, right? Uh, in the end, uh, the, the potential energy tensor you would obtain some so many terms so r would get cancelled over here and er dot er would basically give you one because it's 
the unit vector, right? And you would have the integral going from 0 to a, right? 0 to a, rho naught, m r r d r. So it's 0, to, it's not, so it's not 0 to infinity because we, we have already defined that our sphere is of radius a, right? So be, beyond a, m r is 0, density is 0. So that's why the integral would only go from 0 to a, from center till radius a. Now the hint, now we this this thing over here can be further solved and in the end one would obtain the gravitational potential energy of the system as 3 by 5 g m square over a where m is the total mass of the system and a is the radius. So this is again something that uh, you might, uh, this is always, uh, this is already very striking and you might think that you know it and I'm sure you do because uh, this we have calculated before in our undergrad classes, but using a different lengthy approach, right? But potential energy tensor really uh, makes it a four or five line procedure to get the spherical density of a system, right? The hint from, to go from this step over here is, I have given it here, that you can rewrite this rho naught as mr over four by three pi r cube, right? So if you'll do that, uh, it would become really easy. Uh, it should become really easy to solve this integral over here and in the end you would obtain this, right? Uh, the last thing is that I just want to introduce a term which is gravitational radius, right? So there are systems, for example, clusters or there are systems uh, using telescopes that we see in our sky, for example, very far off galaxies uh, and we find that their boundaries are not very sharp, right? So since because there is a there is a decay in luminosity as we move towards the edges of the galaxy or the clusters, we do not have very sharp boundaries of such systems. So we do not exactly know, even though if there are spherical systems, we can't exactly know the radius of such system. So for the such systems, we define gravitational radius, which is given by rg and which equals g m square over modulus of w right uh, so where m it's the total mass of the system that we have and w it's the total potential energy of the system that we can in principle obtain right so this rg it's used uh, to in morphology uh, of galaxies right and it it gives you a kind of idea that uh, what's the size of the galaxy that we that we are dealing with in general, right? Okay, so so much for today. I hope I'll see you in the next lecture. Ciao.